Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. I'm Tom Askell. Thanks for listening to The Sword and the Trowel today. So glad to have you with us. A big thanks to our fam. We're grateful for those of you who are Founders Alliance members and who support us on a monthly basis. And we hope that you're greatly encouraged by the content up there in the armory. Again, the recent conference that we had down here in Florida is uh, able to be uh, streamed on the armory. So for those of you who are part of the fam, uh, enjoy that. And then for those of you who are not, you can go to founders.org to check out what it means to join the fam. Tom's good to be together today. And uh, boy, there's a lot of things that are going on. And one of the things is this Equality Act uh, recently uh, passed through the House and now going to the Senate. And there's a whole world to deal with here. And we want to spend a little time talking about the Equality Act and what's going on underneath the surface. Yeah. And this has been uh, something, it's not new. I mean, this has been attempted in different times, even decades ago in different uh, governmental venues. And it came up, I think, in 2000. 19 or maybe before that. Uh, but just this last week, the U S house of representatives passed this so-called equality act and it's misnamed. I mean, this is a, this is a great play on words Mm -hmm. because, uh, who's against equality. You vote against this, you're voting against equality. And the way it's been framed is that we're just simply asking for everybody to be treated the same way, despite the fact that they might be LGBTQ plus whatever else that might be, might be included in that. And uh, Joe Biden made this a centerpiece of uh, his uh, campaign. He, a year ago today, a year ago this week in March of 2020, he came out and he said, the first hundred days, I'm going to make this a priority. We're going to get this Equality Act uh, passed and I will sign it because it shouldn't matter who you love and you shouldn't be treated differently. And President Trump hates, you know, we're going to overcome hate with love. And so many people bought it. And, um, you know, today I'm grateful that there are Christians who are crying out against the Equality Act. And it's wonderful to see that. Some of the Christian leaders that uh, we have not always appreciated their uh, voices in the public square over the last few years have come out and said, yes, you know, this is horrible. This is the greatest, greatest attack on religious liberty in our lifetimes. That's certainly true. But it was true a year ago when Joe Biden was uh, trumpeting that he was going to do this. And many of those same voices were never Trumpers or they were saying, oh, goodness, if you vote for Trump, then you got to give up your Christianity or you're compromising or whatever. And um, it just th- th- this thing has so many layers to it. Mm-hmm. It's what we really need to do is try to drill down and get to the bottom. You know, what is it that's underlying uh, the, the worldview, the thinking that has brought us to where we are today so that we see reasons to criticize both the right and the left as well as the Christian as well as the secular. That's right. There, I, I think we'll see a lot of um, uh, evangelical Christians, a lot of Christian leaders in America right now that are saying, hey, this is bad and uh, this is against religious liberty. They might even employ that term religious liberty, which we want to talk mm-hmm. about in just a moment. But it's like not liking the fruit, mm-hmm. but <laughs> fertilizing the root, fertilizing the root. <laughs> yeah, that that's the deal. And, and this is something for all of us. So we, we really do need to see uh, that it's not whether, but which, like if you do not, um, consider God, that is Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his relationship to the state and his relationship to civil magistrates. And if you, if you cut that off and you believe we're living in some kind of neutral land, um, well, then you're going to have this kind of fruit. And so we need mm-hmm. to consider, uh, okay, what is the Equality Act? What are the major problems? And then we want to talk uh, particularly about RIFRA, that is the Religious <laughs> Freedom Restoration Act, which is cited in the Equality Act. <laughs> and it will just it will just open up, um, hopefully, an opportunity for us to consider these yeah, things. And, and I think it's fitting right now because we're going to be coming back to this and we're going to be building off of this, and sometimes we might assume it, to go back to things that we have been hammering on for the last year at least, maybe longer than that, is that this is God's world. He created it. All authority comes from him. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ. So every authority on earth, every legitimate authority exists because God has delegated it from his ultimate authority. So there, there are not two realms of authority. There's not God in the world, or there's not God in secularism, or there's not uh, God in, in politics. No, political leaders have authority because of God, yep. just like fathers or families have authority, just like churches have authority. It's all because of God. So that's foundational. If you don't remember that and keep coming back to that, what we're going to talk about today 
can begin to get confusing to folks. But that's the fundamental reality yes. that undergirds everything. Yeah. It's just, it's, it, that is to simply say God is God. Right? Yeah. Like Genesis 1-1. He, he's one, one, he's right? God. He's God. He, he created everything. Uh, ex yeah. nihilo. And so, all right, let's get into um, some of the details here. The uh, Equality Act, um, it basically is taking the 1964 <clears throat> civil rights legislation and adding to it um, gender identity and sexual orientation. So it's making them designated classes against which one might not discriminate. And there's a lot of details. There's there's some things that are being added, categories that are being added. The, the act itself is very, very bad. And it's going now to the Senate and it has to get 60 votes in the Senate. And it's, it's from what I'm saying, it's probably not going to. So you, some might say, what's the big deal if it's not going to get through the Senate? Maybe it'll be amended or edited or whatever. Um, but we need to say, boy, it passed through the Congress yeah. and it, or it passed through the House. And it did so um, with all sorts of, of bad things in it. The implications are huge. There's actually an article on the National Review in which they interviewed Douglas Laycock, who is the law professor at the University of Virginia. Now, this Laycock is a longtime supporter of same-sex marriage, and he's pointing out that the act, the Equality Act as it is, is just going to absolutely run roughshod over conscientious objectors, mm -hmm. over Christians, and he cites a number of things. It's gonna have huge problems with education, uh, or in, in mainly girls sports, according to this act, you're going to have uh, men competing in girls sports in schools, huge implications for prisons. You're now going to have male, biological male offenders who say, well, my uh, gender identity is female. And now you have a statute um, that is likely to eventually work its way to where men would be in women's prisons. You have uh, religious doctors who want to have conscientious objections to doing certain surgeries, certain procedures um, that in involve transgender and these kinds of things, they're going to have huge problems as well. Yeah. And, and nonprofits, churches, Christian schools, I mean, all of that are in sight as well. They may not be the first line, but the, it's coming because the language is such that there is no barrier to stop the imposition of this type of, uh, of treatment of people, this ideology upon anyone in the United States. For So this, the thing you referred to, let me just read what this Equality Act says about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It says the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 shall not provide a claim concerning or a defense to a claim under a covered title or provide a basis for challenging the application or enforcement of a covered title. So it's like, be quiet. It doesn't matter. But, but we're a church. No, we, I mean, if you adopt this, this, uh, this bill as it is written, you basically just silenced everybody from objecting based upon any kind of principles of religious liter liberty or liberty of conscience. Right. And what's happening then is if you have Christians who basically draw the line at making sure Rifra gets in, right? Because they, yeah. they, well, there's a, been a play, we'll, right. we'll, we'll take Rifra away. Yeah. Right. And then they've set the kind of the window for you. And, you know, we want Rifra in there, you know, and if we win, then we like, yay, yeah, we, we got, got Rifra, Rifra yeah. in with this terrible act. And that concerns what's going on at the bottom of this. This is like what Congressman Stube did was so powerful uh, in, in a congressional uh, meeting. He stands up and he actually goes to scripture. He actually starts talking about what, how God has designed male and female. Now, Congressman Stube, we actually have men members here at Grace that are represented mm -hmm. by Congressman Stube. I'm mm -hmm. just outside of his territory. I think you're just outside mm -hmm. of his territory, but I've got a lot of family in Central Florida, and then we've got members of Grace Baptist yeah. Church that are represented by him. Watch what Congressman Stube said in the halls of Congress and listen to the response that came from one other congressional yeah, from leader. Congress, Congressman Nadler from New York. It's not clothing or personal style that offends God, but rather the use of one's appearance to act out or take on a sexual identity different from the one biologically assigned by God at birth. In his wisdom, God intentionally made each individual uniquely either male or female. When men or women claim to be able to choose their own sexual identity, they are making a statement that God did not know what he was doing when he created them. I'm going to quote directly from Dr. Tony Evans' commentary Bible on this passage of Scripture. Men and women equally share in bearing the image of God, but he has designed them to be distinct from and complementary toward one another. The gender confusion that exists in our culture today is a clear rejection of God's good design. 
Whenever a nation's laws no longer reflect the standards of God, that nation is in rebellion against him and will inevitably bear the consequences. Gentlemen will suspend. The House will be in order. Gentlemen may continue. I'm going to read that line again. Whenever a nation's laws no longer reflect the standards of God, that nation is in rebellion against him and will inevitably bear the consequences. And I think we are seeing the consequences of rejecting God here in our country today. And this bill speaks directly against what is laid out in Scripture. Our government, through this bill, is going to redefine what a woman is and what a man is. It can be anyone who identifies in that gender. Mr. Stubbe, what any religious tradition ascribes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. Well, praise God for <laughs> Congressman Greg Stube And Tony Evans, you know, I'm, it, was it inappropriate for Tony Evans' words about a nation having forsaken God to be cited in the halls of Congress? Man, it was glorious. It was wonderful. It's exactly what Scripture teaches. Yeah, and he exactly. said it. It's right, and we need to be clear on that. You know, if we're going to exposit Scripture, we're going to have to say those kinds of things, and we shouldn't say or, or think, well, oh, but, you know, now we're talking about politics, or now, you know, politicians are listening. Let's get quiet. No. Yes. We're not trying to impose by force anything. We're simply trying to speak the truth of what God has said to anyone and everyone. Yes, and, and, and Greg Stoop here does exactly what congressional leaders are supposed to do. We love reason. We're all about reason and rationale. What Stube is doing is reasoning. He is reasoning, but you always must reason from something. You must reason from data. He is taking data that God has revealed, and he is reasoning from that data to the situation at hand. And what is what's so striking about Representative Jerry Nadler is that he would stand up and say, what any religious uh, group says about these things has nothing to do with this Congress. This Congress is in, is in a neutral territory yeah. that does not have to reference any kind of divinity above. That, I mean, yeah. he, I know that our kind of slogan is one nation under God, but he doesn't have anything to do what's going on. You're not going to tell me which God. Yeah, it, it's it's this whole sense, and that's really a great example of this uh, this common way of thinking today of autonomy. Mm-hmm. You know that Congress is autonomous, individuals are autonomous, uh, nations are autonomous, and whenever you're thinking horizontally, okay, you know there's there's maybe some legitimacy to that. You don't have uh, the right to be me or to try to to rule me outside of proper authorities. But every autonomous entity in the United States in this world on horizontal bases is not autonomous under God because everything comes from God. And this is I'm so fundamental, but we've got to keep hammering this because it's like we try to have these conversations so far downstream, we forget, wait a minute, you know, the yep. source of this stream is God. Yep. He's the one that created everything. And so the authority that Congress has, the authority the United States has, the existence the United States has, is all because of God. Yes. I mean, they got it right. We really are one nation under God. Yeah. Under God. The God. We're not one nation beside God. Yeah. Right? We're not one nation over here in a in a realm upon which God does not touch, you know, uh, in a room, a congressional hearing in which God will not be referenced. It's yeah. like, where did, you know, where did this come from? What we need to see is that it has actually been around for a very long time in our thinking. Yeah. And this is where the Religious Freedom Restoration Act comes in. Again, I think it's horrible that the Equality Act uh, includes uh, rejecting the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That would have huge mm-hmm. uh, problems and implications. But what what we can't do is think that we're going to somehow win if we just go back to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Little pop quiz. Little pop quiz. Uh, 1993 is when the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and guess who was a sponsor for it? Uh, Ronald Reagan. No, wait, no he not. wasn't around. Let's see. Uh. <laughs> Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer was a sponsor of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And I want to say to all the Christians that are like, hey, hey, stop with this Equality Act. It will it will transgress on our religious liberties, our religious freedom. Well, who advocates for that in 1993? Chuck Schumer. Do you really want to go back to the place? No, you want to go back to the thing that Chuck Schumer gave you, you see? And so well, there's huge implications here. We yeah. need to spend a little time talking about the Religious Freedom Restoration yeah, Act. Yeah, we do. And, and let's, let's give the benefit of the doubt. So there's two things. One, Chuck Schumer 
in the world of 1993 was better than Chuck Schumer in the world of 2021. So let's give that. I mean, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships we, we and can, a lowering tide. We can grant lowers there's been some, some movement. Absolutely. So in that, but I mean, Chuck Schumer fundamentally, to my knowledge, has not shifted from 1993 to today. I mean, he's the same man, same principles, same ways of thinking, same presuppositions. And so uh, go back and look at this Freedom Restoration Act. Let's talk what about, does it actually say? Let's talk about the text. So we have a wonderful First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law prohibiting the exercise of religion. That is the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the exercise of religion. Uh, what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act essentially does is say, except... <laughs> If there's when, extenuating circumstances. When, when there's a good reason for us to do so, then we will prohibit the exercise of religion. Here's the actual text of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 1993. Uh, it says under Section 2, uh, Congregational Findings and Declaration of Purposes. Under Findings, the Congress finds that, one, the framers of the Constitution recognize free exercise of religion as an inalienable right secured its protection in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Yes and amen to number one. Number two, laws, quote, neutral, unquote, toward religion may burden religious exercise as surely as laws intended to interfere with religious exercise. So in the second clause, they're saying that laws neutral toward religion, they're assuming that there are such laws that are neutral toward religion, may indeed burden religious exercise as surely as the ones that are intended from the very beginning to interfere with it. And then third, governments should not substantially burden religious exercise without compelling justification. Oh, what's compelling? (laughs) So if we, and even the substantially burden, so it might be like we can incidentally burden your religious exercise without any justification. But if we're going to substantially burden your exercise, we'll need compelling justification. And how will we find out what is compelling justification? Well, we're certainly not going to be looking to God's word because that's already been ruled out. We're not allowed to talk about God in the Congress and what he has revealed. And so we'll just kind of sense by our own minds and our own senses, somehow we'll come up with what is a compelling justification. And when we find that compelling justification, we will substantially burden your religious exercise. Yeah. So, the, I mean, that's the uh, congressional findings of this act and the, the way that it's going to be interpreted, has been interpreted, is going to be applied. And it's, uh, we need to wake up and realize, okay, back in 1993, when this act became law, these things were baked into it. They were. Yeah. And, now, and now we're downstream and we've got the Equality Act and we're fighting uh, about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which already has the problem baked right into it. Again, this is where um, Richard Weaver is so, so helpful here. Ideas have consequences. I would highly recommend reading Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver. And I don't believe he's a Christian. Uh, I know he's a mm-hmm. conservative thinker. And he called it the metaphysical dream. And, and by that, he simply meant this, this objective standard that is above us, that transcends us, that is not simply found in us, whether as an individual or as a community. But there is, there's a standard up there. And life down here is to accord with it. As Christians, we know this is mm-hmm. God's world world, he makes the rules. Uh, The problem is, is if you lose that, if you lose any sense of this transcendent, of of truth that is above us, of truth, Christ is the truth. If you lose that sense, well, down here, you'll have all sorts of um, neutrality. You'll have absolute chaos. And so in the second clause, when it says laws neutral toward religion, well, the way that modern Americans think about that is that there can be these laws that are neutral, that, that aren't affecting your kind of religion, aren't affecting your Christianity. But what they mean is laws that have nothing to do with Christ, nothing to do with, with his lordship over all things, nothing to do with the creator. It's just a neutral thing. And it just so happens to incidentally or substantially burden your religious practice. And that's not legitimate. That's not the way that you ought to think about the laws that are established by Congress. We pray for uh, congressional leaders here all the time. And we ask that God would help them to fear him and to do what is just, what is right. 
And as soon as you ask that question, you say, well, what's just, what's yeah. right? Well, there's a standard. You're not in some kind of neutral territory where you get to make it up. Yeah. I think Christians get nervous about this because it sounds like, oh no, man, you're trying to establish a theocracy or you're trying to impose uh, upon people. Well, n- we're not trying to call out armies and uh, coerce folks, but we are trying to persuade. We are saying, yeah, there is a God in heaven, and yes, there is right, there is wrong, and we want those who will legislate and those who will rule politically to do what is right, not to do what is wrong. And that's a, I mean, that's just basic, that's Mm -hmm. foundational. Baptists who have argued and died for liberty of conscience throughout history have not shied away from that. I mean, the the best of Baptists have recognized, no, uh, we want our magistrates to stay in their lane. We want them to recognize that they are servants of the living Christ and that they are obligated to do what is right, not what is wrong. I think, you know, Obadiah Holmes, whenever he, in New England, uh, uh, in Massachusetts Bay Colony, when he went with two guys to preach the gospel and to administer the Lord's Supper to uh, a man who was in that colony that was a Baptist and wasn't going along with the state religion at that time, Uh, He was arrested along with his two friends. He refused to pay the fine, and he forced the magistrate to beat him publicly. And so he was so bloodied that he had to sleep on his knees and elbows for a while. I mean, it was just miserable uh, what happened to him. But he did it in order to make a statement. You don't have the authority to tell us that we cannot worship God according to the dictates of our conscience as we find the Word of God instructing us. And he actually did a great deal for religious liberty by suffering in that way. It's the same thing I think going on today with James Coates. You know, people tried to convince us, well, this isn't a religious liberty issue and that, you know, they're treating all institutions the same way they're treating churches in Edmonton and Alberta, uh, Canada. And so when James goes to prison because he refuses to say only 15% of the congregation can meet, we'll go along with the public health officials. Well, he's just kind of posing, you know, he's setting himself up to be a fake martyr. Not at all. He sees these things clearly as his sermons have indicated, and he's willing to suffer the consequences of standing against unjust, in this case, um, well, unjust actions by public health officials enforced by the civil servants of Alberta. And if we don't see this, if you don't get this, then you're going to be confused yeah. about a lot of the things that are going on now and more things that are coming down the pike. Yeah, I think some some Christians are a little nervous about it and they think it's the whole theocracy thing. But I think a lot more <laughs> Christians right now see what's happening. They see, wait, who's persecuting who? Is Are we still in the day where, you know, we got Christians in civil authority that are persecuting somebody because of their view of baptism? Or do we have the so-called secularists who have been pretending not to be religious mm-hmm. that are actually telling the Christians, your religious freedom act is not going to count here. I mean, wake up to this. Your House of Representatives just passed that act. Yeah. Your representatives just said, um, you know, we're going to have you start to acknowledge acknowledge this gender identity and sexual orientation. And if you try to claim some kind of religious liberty uh, position, we're actually going to cut that off. And so what's happening is we're seeing everybody has an absolute of some sort. So it's, it's Christ or idolatry. It's, it's, it's going to be Christ or it's going to be something else that is actually functioning as an absolute. <laughs> we're not the kind of people, we're not the kind of beings that operate down here in the subjective and really allow everybody to kind of do whatever they want. So one of the key things here, I think, is, to, is connection to Coates, is to understand uh, the difference between liberty of conscience or you could call it slash Christian liberty, and then this notion of religious liberty as conceived by modern Americans. You're talking about two different things. Now, they can, you, they can be very much related, but we need to help people think clearly about what's going on here. I posted a recent article about a liberty of conscience in James Coates' decision and Christ being Lord of magistrates at founders.org. And it was clarifying to me because this is what our confession says, 1689 Baptist Confession, speaking about liberty of conscience or slash Christian liberty. Again, the 1689 Confession does not have an article called Religious Liberty. Religious liberty is this American notion, and it's broader than America, and it's fine to talk in those terms, but we need to make sure what people know what we're saying when we say religious liberty, and we need to know what the Confession says about liberty of conscience slash Christian liberty. This is what the Confession says, chapter 21, paragraph 2. 
God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are in anything contrary to his word or not contained in it. So that to believe such doctrines or obey such commands out of conscience is to betray true liberty of conscience and the requiring of an implicit faith an absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. And so you and me, our consciences are free from any doctrines or commandments of man that are in any way contrary to or not contained in God's word. So the idea of our consciences being free is absolutely related to law. It's absolutely related to the divine standard in the word. And so if I were a civil authority and I came to you and said, like kind of like the James Coates situation, they're conditioning certain things upon his release. If I said to you, uh, well, you can go free from jail, Tom, just sign here that you won't murder anybody. Um, well, I'm not requiring anything of you that is outside of God's word. That's actually inside God's word. So you could say, well, I have a conscientious objection to doing that, but it wouldn't be a matter of liberty of conscience because I'm not requiring anything. Your conscience is actually not free from the command that I just gave as a civil authority because the command is in accordance with God's word. So when you're talking liberty of conscience or Christian liberty, you are always ta- not only talking about the conscience, you're talking about the conscience and its relationship to what God has revealed. With this religious liberty notion, what's happened is because we've cut off the metaphysical dream, as Richard Weaver says, we think, well, you're free to worship God according to the dictates of your own conscience. But what happens is Christians hear that and they they have all of this going on. But modern man hears that and says, well, God is a doorknob. And the way that I worship him is by sleeping with 16 year old girls as a 28 year old man. And then we say, no, 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 no. You, you, that's not, that is contrary to God's word. What we meant by worshiping God, according to the dictates of your own conscience, God has to be defined. Your conscience has to be defined and some standard has to be defined that, that I'm not saying that the founders, when they talked about religious liberty meant that, but that is the way modern man assesses religious liberty doctrine. So Christians should go back and say, okay, is there this neutral area that even according to the religious freedom restoration act, You can have neutral laws and you can have some kind of neutrality and a religious liberty concept that doesn't have reference to what God himself has revealed and study that confession about what liberty of conscience slash Christian liberty really means. Yeah. And it goes right back to the fact that we are not living here autonomously. We are creatures made in God's image. There's a God in heaven to whom we're all accountable. Every individual, every institution, every legitimate authority is accountable to God. And so whenever you start saying, you know, well, I don't like this. My conscience is this. And so you've got to honor my conscience because I do think it's legitimate for me to um, worship a doorknob or have uh, immoral sexual practices. That's my conscience. Who are you to, to dictate to me? We're not saying, oh, I'm Tom Askell, I'm going to dictate to you. No, we're saying there's a God in heaven who dictates to you. That's right. There's a God in heaven who made you. He defines what's right, what's wrong. If we love people, we're going to tell them that. If we love people, we're not going to just let them continue to run headlong over a cliff thinking that they're free, claiming their liberty of conscience. We're going to stand at the cliff and we're going to do our best to scream at them, to convince them to stop and consider the fact that they're breathing God's air, Their heart beats according to God's kindness and mercy. They eat God's food and they have rebelled against him. And one day they're going to stand before him and he will be the only judge of the whole world. And in that day, they will either be either be declared righteous because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, or they will be condemned to an eternal hell. Mm -hmm. The people that don't believe in hell, those people are not going to be kept out of hell because they don't believe in it. I mean, that's where we've just got to come back to thinking what the Bible says And if we believe that, well, then let's lovingly, kindly, firmly, unapologetically declare it. And I I fear that we've uh, we've been moved so far downstream that we just forgotten that we are here because of God and that the fundamental principle, fundamental reality is that there's a God in heaven before whom we all 
must stand one day and give an account. And our only hope on that day is the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection for sinners. Mm. When it comes to this Equality Act, you know, the message of Christians is not, hey, we don't want that. You know, we don't we don't love people who struggle with uh, sexual orientation or whatever. That's not what we're saying at all. This is genuine love. And Mm -hmm. Congressman Stube stood there and and it displayed that by saying uh, it's not that, oh, you know, your secularists are going to establish this law and it's going to trouble my family. It's going to trouble, you know, my church. It's not just that. It's like we love people and we want laws that are just. We want laws that are loving, that are good for people. And you don't get that without acknowledging that Jesus Christ is not only Lord of his church, he is king of kings. And he's not only a king, but he's a priest. He's a priest. He's a priest king. That is, this this king, you don't want any other king than this. That's our message to the world. You want this king because uh, he not only rules, but he saves, he redeems. This mm-hmm. Christ, the very king uh, who is who has declared his word to this lost and dying world, came down, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in this life for sinners, lived a perfectly righteous life, died on the cross and rose again. And he is the only savior. And therefore we talk about these things because we love Christ. We love people. We want Christ to be glorified as the priest king that he is. Thanks so much for listening to The Sword and the Trowel today. Uh, We are grateful that you tune in and hope that it has been a helpful one for you.